Good morning, both here in Hall 2, Hall 2 of uh, Flanders Expo, and those watching from a distance. Welcome to the session, European, Europe's digital renaissance, balancing innovation and responsibility. My name is Tim Verheide, and I will be your host for the next 40 minutes. Balancing innovation and responsibility, that is how Europe deals with technology that keeps pushing the limits and at the same time is omnipresent and crucial for our well-being. Europe is aiming for a true digital renaissance, a human-centric approach on digital acceleration with norms and values fit for digital combined with ambitious technological targets for 2030. In this session, we bring together senior leadership and future thinkers to explore the opportunities for European member states, but also the challenges and it imposes for governments as well as private companies. So, it will be 40 very well-filled minutes. Therefore, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. He is a serial entrepreneur, Forbes contributor, contributor best-selling author, and one of the most in-demand thought leaders on the impact of all things digital on society and businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Hinze. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Um, an absolute pleasure to be here um, at this event and to have a very brief discussion on where I think we're heading in Europe. When you look at the changes that we have, this is the very simple uh, summary of my entire professional career, the transition from analog to digital. And 25 years ago, I had the pleasure to meet Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the MIT Media Lab, and he wrote a brilliant book 25 years ago called Being Digital. And in this book, he said, there's only two types of companies in the world. You have bits companies, whose main ingredient is information, and you have atoms companies. If you're a bank, you're a bits company, and digital is relatively easy. But if you're a cement company, you're not transporting information. You're transporting molecules, atoms. But in this book, 25 years ago, Nicker Ponti said, eventually, every single atoms company will transform into a bits company. And that very much has been the guiding lens through which I look at the world. I wrote a book on this now 12 years ago called The New Normal, and I want to apologize for that book. I thought it was a sexy title when I wrote that 12 years ago, and now I can't stand it anymore. But I wanted to describe the power of S-curves. And S-curves has been probably the fundamental leverage instrument that I have seen throughout my entire career. In the beginning, something is strange and we don't understand, starts to grow, and then it flips and becomes normal. And I love this illustration if you look at the world of mobile phones. Um, a wonderful slide where you see the beginning of that evolution, where using a mobile phone was a two-man job. It was something that was very, very strange, very, very special, and then all of a sudden, boom, it becomes absolutely normal. And this is exactly the type of behavior patterns that we see over and over again. There must be people in this room who actually played Doom when they were younger. Well, recently somebody in the US hacked a pregnancy test and was able to install and run Doom on a piece of throwaway electronics that you can buy in a CVS Hell for $22.95. It's a perfect example of these S-curves. And I had the pleasure to do quite a lot of work with Carlota Perez, one of the leading economic thinkers of our day and age. She wrote a brilliant book on this called Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital. And she has been studying these S-curves her entire career. These S-curves, something is strange, we don't understand, starts to grow and then becomes normal. It's something that she has observed throughout economic history. When you look at industrial revolution, steam, railways, mass production, telecommunications, over and over, we see the same type of pattern. But these patterns used to take 20, 30 years to materialize. And I think what we now have to realize is they're probably going to happen faster and more abrupt. We're used as a society to deal with these fundamental changes, but if they're happening faster and faster, we might see the challenges, the discomfort, the disruption. And I really fundamentally believe that we're entering into an era with more seismic shocks, and a significant amount of them will be technological, especially now. I think the last nine months have been incredible, where technology like AI that we've had for 40, 50 years has now all of a sudden become absolutely mainstream. 
And I love this quote, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. And I really fundamentally believe that this is the era that we live in today. I refer to it very much as the never normal. And that always reminds me of that famous line by Rumsfeld when he talks about the unknown unknowns. You have your known knowns, you know what you know. You have your known unknowns, you know what you don't know. But more and more, we live in a world of unknown unknowns. And Peter Drucker phrased this beautifully a long time ago when he said the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, the never normal, but to act with yesterday's logic. And I really urge you to think about this. How often do you see in your organization, in your context, yesterday's logic being used in a world that is moving faster than ever before? This becomes now the number one priority of virtually every organization. We have more and more information and less and less time to turn that into actionable knowledge. And now we even think, how did we ever do it without the use of digital? This is probably my favorite slide of the moment. This is the FBI fingerprint record keeping department in 1953. Imagine that you had to run that in 1953. How would you even label the file cabinets? Or even worse, when a policeman comes in and says, I found the fingerprint, how would you even start running a match? We now think that it was impossible to do that without the use of digital. But I think that was just the warm-up act. I think the real fun now begins. And this was the cover of The Economist a few weeks ago. AI is going to be heaven and hell. It's going to be amazing and really scary at the same time. AI, for the first time, might help us to solve the productivity paradox, because we're all using digital tools. But most of us are still using Microsoft Word, like the old mechanical typewriter of 30 years ago. AI is amazing, but there are plenty of scary things. There are black boxes where we don't really understand how it works. There is inherent bias. And I love this quote, there, if you torture data enough, it will confess to everything. It might be even more so in a world of content. John Nasbitt said beautifully three decades ago, we're drowning in information and starved of knowledge. And most companies today have done an amazing job to focus on data, on structured data, on data science over the last couple of years. And data science is that world where the combination of math and statistics combined with computer science is applied to a domain knowledge. But with the emerging trend of what we have today in AI, it's not just structured data. It's the world of language. Combine that with algorithms and apply it to particular domains. I think we have an amazing experience today in the world of data science, but in the world of content science and content governance, we're just getting started. Many people get worried. I read this book recently called Framers, not a particularly good book, but a really good opening question. In a world of artificial intelligence, in a world of algorithms, why do we still need humans? As I said, I was not convinced by the book, but the cover is fantastic. It shows two red hands making a frame. And the short version of the book is everything inside of that is going to be done better by an algorithm, but we humans are there to frame. I think this transition is just the beginning. But to order to you know, stimulate some of the discussions in the debate, I have seen four big revolutions in my career. The first was when the World Wide Web made digital normal. And we saw an enormous amount of creative activity around the world. But in the end, most of us rely on predominantly US players. The second was the world of mobile. And I remember when I was starting out as a young engineer 30 years ago, we had the Siemensons and the Ericssons and the Nokias and the Alcatels. But today, the world of mobile is completely controlled by two US companies who are 27 miles from each other in Silicon Valley. We're in a third revolution now where the cloud has made things possible. And although we had brilliant ideas in Europe to build our own hyperscalers, the truth today is that the cloud is governed by two companies in Seattle, Amazon and Microsoft. It's the Coke and Pepsi, and the rest is basically quantité négligeable. And we run the extreme risk in the world of AI. The fourth big revolution that we have is that, again, we see an enormous dominance of only US players. If you look at that today, and you look at what happens in the world of large language models, these are the top 10 funding of large language models that we have seen in the last one year. But if you look at it, the top nine of them are US, Canadian, Israeli companies, 
Europe only comes at the 10th place, and it's not where we should be. On top of that, the worst thing is that a lot of these large language models are being fed on data that is our data. We have a new form of colonialism that is starting, the world of data colonialism, where our data is being harvested to actually make these models even more powerful. And I think this is a wake-up call. In Europe, we have had the amazing opportunity to build things that really matter on a global scale. We in Europe have the talent to build things and to do that and really show the world that we're made of. But the number one ingredient to do this is talent. And that is crucial. We heard Pascal Coppens you know, um, recently where he talked about the difference between talent and what you see as necessity ingredients to build that future. We in Europe are going to have to wake up, understand the complexity, and act now. Because we live in a world that is more volatile than ever before. I call these Hemingway patterns. You might know the story, but I love this. Ernest Hemingway actually went bankrupt. When that happened, a journalist went up to him and said, Mr. Hemingway, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, in two ways, gradually and then suddenly. This is the world that we live in. Things happen very slowly, and then boom, we have to be ready. I hope we have an inspiring debate because Europe really has a chance to really be the player in AI, but we have to move right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter Hinz, and indeed you stay around for the debate. As you might have seen here in the room, not at home or at the office where you are watching, these subtitles, subtitles are AI generated, so there's nobody behind the desk. This is AI at work right here in this room. Now we are going to listen to a short keynote on building a future fair data economy given by the business designer at Gaia X Finland Hub, coordinated by Citra. Please give him a round of applause, Mr. Danny Wong. Right, good morning, Flanders. Um, in the next five minutes or so, I'm going to try to give you a bit of a context where Peter has already mentioned, but in a more uh, different angle to that, right? So why are we living what we're living through now? Why is it going fast? And what's the alternative narrative that we need to have? So let's start with the first one. Um, digital economy is about 15% of the global GDP. Uh, that was the last number from the World Bank. There's a bit about... 14 trillion, there's a lot of zeros. And what's interesting there is it is growing 2.5 times faster than the physical world, and that's fast. For the last 10 years, we've been doing that. Now, maybe that's a bit abstract what it means, right? Let's go to the next slide to give it a bit more interesting. Time, a technology to, goes to reach 500, 500 million users. TV, it took them 22 years, right? Some of you might have seen these slides. Electric City, 46 years. So, right? If you go back in time, you will see also that cars took about 60 years to reach 500 million users. Now, this is what we know already, right? And if you go ahead, computer took 14 years. Mobile phone took 12 years, and you see that acceleration going on. Internet took seven years. And what breaks all that is Pokemon Go, 19 days, right? 2016, that happened. Now let's up the scale. Time to reach 100 million users. We know that too. Facebook took four years, six months. Instagram, nearly half of those. Now, again, WeChat one year, two months, right? See the, see the patterns? TikTok, nine months. Chat GPT, two months. Who's going to top that? Thread, five days, right? Now, this is what we are up against. This is what we live every day, the speed of innovation, what Peter mentioned there earlier on. So what are we going to do about that, right? And comes the next slide, right? Today, 90% of all platform, digital economies are coming out from China and US. And that's obviously, you know, we've seen that, we've seen what we say. This is what we are get up against. Um, and that is what we need to find a way forward 
to see how we can approach this in a different manner. So, so, I, I, so the divide, right? So we have three different narratives going on. The US version, where all this digital economy is driven by private sector first. And this is how they got to where they got to today, such a big um, leaders. And then we have the Europe version on how we can actually do better regulation and partnership and a China version, which also we've seen earlier from Pascal. Now, the question then is, so what's the new narrative, right? European Commission estimate that in 2025, the European data economy is gonna be uh, 800 or 800 billion market. So what narrative are we doing, right? So European Union, as we all know, started as trying to build a digital single market that allows products and services flow across the 27 that we know. And then comes Schengen, right? People can move freely across 27 countries. And then the next step now is really about building infrastructure that allows data to share across the 27 countries, right? Whether that is access or whether that is share. And the idea is to have a more open, fair, and decentralized approach. Now that's the value that we believe and this is the belief narrative that we would like to have. And all that means that also we need to think it through an ecosystem thinking beyond just a single unit as a company, beyond one entities, but rather as ecosystem level thinking. And this is bringing me to the next slide here uh, of the different use cases of work that we are doing in Citra in Finland. And one of those is the Finnish time, maritime data space where we put together multiple companies in different areas with the same value chain and come together to work sharing data and build business value for the uh, companies. Another work that we also do is the European Health Data, which Citra is a coordinator. And the next one is also coming up. And there we really build towards European Health Data space. And part of that work also contribute to a national legislation that in Finland we legis legislate that secondary use of data is open for uh, legit reason of company who would like to access that. So these are two quick examples. There's much, much more out there. And for me, to end this, I say we need to go towards the path of human design, but more even humanity-centric. Human design as individual towards that person. But if you go bigger, that person lives in a society, in a group of people, communities. And if you go further, this group of communities lives in an environment. And all this needs to be taken into account as we build forward the future, and hence the humanity-centric approach that we are prone for. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank you, Danny. And indeed, it is now time for our debate. And that's why I'm joined here on stage by Ralph Beurler, Data and Innovation at Digital Flanders. For today, he will be my co-host. Welcome, Ralph. Ralph, shall we bring in our other guests? That's an excellent uh, idea. We've already seen uh, Peter and Danny. And now we will be joined by, from the European Commission, uh, Andrea Halmus. Uh, deputy head of the unit of TG Digit, and also the CEO of Luxembourg National Data Services, Bert Verdonk. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. So welcome all. We are very honored to have you as our guests. In this debate, we are going to discuss three statements. And the first one is brought to us by Peter. Yes, absolutely. So maybe to kick it off, the first statement is um, Europe's focus um, on regulation. So Europe regulatory drift is actually holding back innovation. And just to put that into context, it's not that I think that regulation and innovation don't mix. I take the example of Formula One. Um, one of the most highly regulated sports out there and extremely innovative. And a lot of this technology development that happens in Formula One eventually makes it down into mainstream. So it's not that they are necessarily opposed, but if you look at what happens in Europe today, we seem to have a tsunami of regulation. It started with GDPR, but when you look at the Digital Services Act and now the AI Act, we seem to have more and more regulation. And my fear is that this is actually going to put a break on innovation, that many European initiatives are almost stifled as a result of this, and it means that I think we have to be careful and maybe tone down 
the regulatory drift. Yeah. Mr. Wong, Danny, we are on a first name basis here, right? What is your take on this? Is regulation holding back innovation? I think it's a good question. In, in my opinion, if we try to regulate too early, then it tends to stifle innovation in a way that it becomes a burden for companies, especially if you move towards the compliance part. You know, uh, I think innovation needs space, need oxygen, and also market opportunity to develop. You know, we've seen also the slides that Peter showed you, the S curve. I think it's interesting uh, to link that to when as technology mature, I think that's where regulation probably fits very well. But the question is, what's the role of regulation at the early stage when it's still at the fringe? I think that's a balance we sort of need to take into account, especially from a small company perspective who has less resources to do compliance, you know, understand what it means when the regulation comes into play. So I will bring that on the table to balance that conversation. Now, Andrea, uh, innovation needs uh, space to grow. Is Europe leaving enough space with the initiatives like the Data Act, Data Governance Act, AI Act, and Triple Europe Act? Absolutely. I think what is important to see is that uh, these uh, new legislations come in um, and, and kind of create a, even an example for others to follow. So you may have seen that the GDPR has been picked up by countries outside of the EU, for example, most recently in the California Consumer Privacy Act, but also by others, the, the, uh, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, and all the data strategy-related uh, activities, AI Act. So they all show an example, and I think what we're seeing is that, you know, Europe is, is trying to create a more value or more uh, human-driven uh, uh, regulatory framework. But at the same time, um, so we're putting the human at the center of it, creating principles that uh, the legislations follow, and at the same time trying to put in place different infrastructure or different mechanisms so that, for example, through regulatory sandboxing or other means, we could actually see what the impact of that regulation could be. So I don't think that we're actually um, slowing down innovation with that, but we're putting it into that frame that you had referred to earlier. Yeah. Bert, Bert Verdong, for you there is even beauty in regulation. Yeah, of course, I, I recognize that there are some risks uh, and, and some things might be too early or may, may be become too complicated, but there's also opportunity. And if you, you mentioned Formula One, but also look at the way we use mobile phones. Uh, the mobile uh, industry has, is extremely regulated and it has broken through and, and we use it in a very easy user experience every day. Also, GPS is a very regulated technology with satellites and all the infrastructure around it, but we've, used, we've, we've learned to use it in a very practical manner. Yeah, so regulation, in that sense, also has given an opportunity to break through with something in the balance with, with, with human rights and, and, and the values we stand for, but also allowing an, an, a business opportunity uh, for a lot of parties to, to break through in a, in a new domain. So and I think that is the positive side of and also the necessity of having these regulations in place. Okay, it's already time for a second statement, Rob, which already. is brought by you. Okay, then. Now, Pascal Coppers uh, shaped the difference between, uh, the difference in thinking between the US, which is quite uh, liberal, and China, which is quite government controlled, and Europe. Europe, in contrast with the others, is more value driven which emphasizes on how to protect uh, the fundamental rights uh, for us as a citizen. Now, I'm wondering, does this offer the soil for a new renaissance, maybe a first digital uh, renaissance, Andrea? I think that's a wonderful uh, expression and I, I fully agree with it. Probably it's time for that. And as I said, in Europe we do have a um, very strong sense of human-centric thinking. If you think of also past uh, philosophers like Rousseau's uh, uh, idea about a social contract or philosophers that uh, look into the uh, ethics of, of, uh, of information and knowledge like uh, Luciano Fioridi and others, we, we do have a, a possibly a different way of, of going forward with the digital transformation and putting really the human as you said, both the individual and humanistic uh, principles and values into the, um, into the forefront. 
And what we see is that past, uh, for example, we've seen, I, uh, I work a lot in the digital government area, we've seen a huge move from focusing on efficiency and effectiveness of digital government towards a, a public value driven digital government through the digital declarations of ministers, for example, the, the Berlin Ministerial Declaration, we really need human-centric uh, uh, digital transformation. And I think there is a, a, a new momentum for that. And you've seen that in the, for example, uh, uh, recent AI Act and other, so other uh, legislations where we put in front the EU values, principles, and, and uh, human, humanistic values, if you may. Okay. Now, Danny, Europe's digital renaissance it sounds very good, but of course we live in a globalized world. Yeah, definitely. I mean, based on what you know, what the speaker, other speakers have said, and what Peter also shown us, you know, today, matter of fact, is you know, if you look at the global digital market leaders, is U.S. Right? You know, they have taken a separate route where they use private initiative, private companies, private sector to drive that growth globally, and the result we've seen today. Now. In Europe, we believe that we could have a different narrative towards building that, the future that is much more open and fair. So that's one thing. And, and then you have China has to take a different approach. There. It's interesting to see how this will play out. We would, not, we would probably see in the next few years. But also, we also realize that you know, when you have this scram, scram, transatlantic transfer of data, that you see that there's a conflict between US law and European law. And as a business that's going to be active globally, it's not making it easier for us to do business. So does that mean that we will see more of this type of divide, this type of uh, situation moving forward? That's the question I would also pose on the table. Peter, what do you think? Will we see more of these conflicts in the future? I think so. And, and I like this idea that we should be more focused on value in Europe. But the US isn't focused on value. It's focused on value creation. And that is a fundamentally different way of looking at the world. What is the difference? Well, the difference is that we live in a world where scale really matters. And I take the cloud as an example. The idea uh, that we had with the hyperscalers with Gaia-X in Europe was a brilliant idea. But the reality is that if you want to build a global platform at the rate, then this is an arms race where you need to invest an enormous amount of capital, we have basically lost that game. Even in the US, there's only two players. I mean, look at Google, it's playing catch up to the top two. So I love this focus on value, but I think we need to have much more emphasis on value creation in Europe. No, Bert, uh, yeah. do you agree with Peter? Uh, I think Gaia X is a brilliant idea, but yet we have used uh, only US cloud solutions so far. No, that's true, and, and I'm active member of the board of Gaia X, and, and indeed we struggle to translate uh, how can we then do that in a different manner. And we've seen hefty debates in that community that some people try to get back to a protectionist uh, a position which we believe will not survive because there are these big uh, scalers, scale matters, and there, there are these big players. So what we've tried to do, I think, in a more positive way is to bring transparency to that market, create also somewhat more equal opportunities for other participants to also get a chance to play. Um, and, and that's at least even the large US providers have already shifted, are shifting their terms and conditions closer to what we, 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 we feel are important European values. So even through that discussion and that debate um, with all of these stakeholders, we have managed, I think, to change the position and the attitude of some of these players, which is already a good thing. And the next steps uh, remain to be seen. We will conclude the discussion on the second statement and uh, move to the third, Tim. Yes, we heard in the keynotes also the importance, of a, the importance of AI transformation for businesses and society. AI can bring so much and so many innovation, but how can we build in ethical boundaries? How can we bring back trust while at the same time make sure we don't push the brakes on European innovation. The third the statement for this debate is though, what should be Europe's take on AI? Back. Well, we can be afraid. Yeah, there is of absolutely risks and uh, we need some regulation and we need controls to make it stable. But I would also again like to look at uh, the, the opportunity side uh, of AI because we know um, that we will need it in our, in our modern society to balance, to get out 
uh, value less work uh, to, to avoid repetitive tasks or tasks where people do not really um, are able to, to do what they're really good at. And so there is this opportunity for AI to really help us manage our lives. Um, also, AI to help us control uh, compliance and regulation. So there is also there an opportunity um, to not play regulations by the book and by paper or by court, but avoid that we need to get in court and let AI help us uh, manage these, um, these, uh, our, our way of living. So that is the big opportunity that is out of there. Of course, we need to make sure that the data that is needed to train that AI is acquired in a fair manner. And there again, regulation comes in to keep also the, the learning of these AI algorithms in an acceptable manner. Andrea, what can you add from the European Commission's point of view? Obviously, as you know, the uh, forthcoming AI Act, which is still in final negotiation phase, is setting the kind of human-centric approach to AI. So it's a risk-based approach based on which certain solutions will be allowed, others will be allowed with further uh, rigor. Uh, and I think that's the right approach. I mean, AI can bring a lot of uh, interesting new um, uh, optimization, for example, I'm thinking now that specifically the pri uh, public sector optimizing internal resources, better decision making, uh, just because you have more uh, information and knowledge. But of course, what we absolutely need to make sure is that there is always the, at least in, a, uh, in our context, there is always the human final uh, decision uh, taken based on the information that's been provided to you. And um, so there are some uh, very, uh, let's say, more uh, gloomy uh, ideas about AI, but I think with having the European legislation in place will create the right framework and hopefully will also inform others beyond the uh, EU. Maybe a brief reaction, Peter? I think we cannot afford to lose this battle. I think AI is, as I said, the fourth battle. We've lost the, third, the first three. If we lose this one, game's over. And I think we have to double down in terms of investments, in terms of focus. And I think this is where we can shine as Europe, but we cannot afford to lose this battle. Cannot afford to lose this battle. Um, Danny, how important is it for you to put humanity at the center of this renaissance? Yeah. And then I think, as, as what other speakers have said, my feeling is that we need to put humanity in the center of all this, right? Um, AI today, we need to understand what's the limitation, what's the constraint. Uh, if AI has been used, what is, there's no black boxes. So we know what's happening behind. So there's observability, and we know how that decision has been made as a tool. And this is the role of human, right? We need to be there to use the tool, and that tool needs to work for us, humanity in the center in that sense. And it's even more important that we need to be relentless to make sure that we don't give up. And that is, for me, especially in this era of algorithm, human is even more important than ever. OK, thank you all so much for your thoughts. Don't go away yet, but before we go uh, to the other breakout sessions, we have another speaker. I want to thank our panelists uh, for their insights. If people have questions, you will be around, I think, for a few more minutes to have uh, probably very, very interesting uh, conversations. So thank you for being part of this debate. Don't go yet because, as I mentioned, Raf, we have another speaker also. Yes, uh, and absolutely. Thank you all for. Um, to conclude, we are going to listen to the acting CEO of uh, Aptuma, Atumi, who is going to give us the key takeaways. Please welcome Bjorn de Vitz. <laughs> Thank you, Raf. Very interesting debate. And as a wrap-up, I have three main conclusions for you. First of all, yes. Yes, Europe is onto something by bringing more balance between innovation and responsibility. And with the Data Act and the AI Act, for instance, Europe is definitely in the lead. And certainly in the field of data tech, where Atumi, the data utility company, is in uh, in the lead and its pioneering, we see this very clearly. The European ecosystem is bringing back citizens and companies in control of their data. For example, if we look at the um, uh, Nordics and Finland, it is clear that they are very 
um, very forward thinking in the trust framework and with my data operators and how that governance looks like. But what I also have been able to conclude at the My Data Conference in Helsinki this year is that Flanders with it to me is a global leader in implementing that trust framework in actual production life use cases where we give citizens back control of their data. As my second conclusion, of course, value-driven innovation is of utmost importance for Europe. We live in a new geopolitical reality and therefore Europe is searching for its own path. And we don't need to be afraid of being bold in our ambition. I remember the, I remember the metaphor of Formula One that was uh, mentioned in the debate by Peter and by Bert. And indeed, it's a very good example of a highly regulated sport that stimulates innovation by design. And I think we are seeing this already becoming a reality also in the field of data tech where new data-driven ecosystems are arousing that combine brains, power and innovation to push this vision forward. But I also support Peter Hinson's conviction that besides regulation, you need resources, seed capital, investments and brains to be able to turn regulation into innovation at scale. My third and last conclusion, AI. AI can be the exact lever that we need, the battle that we should not lose. AI is a global innovation race where we see that other continents are not playing by the same rules and don't hold on to the same human values. We need to leverage on these European values for AI. And at this moment, European legislation for AI is still under debate, is still under discussion with the parliaments and the member states. But I think we need to grab the opportunity of the Belgian presidency to force a breakthrough in this field in the upcoming months. And as the data utility concerns, we are dedicated into supporting the EU's quest for digital renaissance by restoring digital trust, by restoring data sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Björn, um, yeah, for these stunning key takeaways. Now, before Tim and I say goodbye, just one more thing. <laughs> we like to invite you all to the CIMIC 2024 20, conference that we will be hosting in Brussels on the 27th of June. Thanks, and that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you so much for being here. A human-centric digital renaissance, Rob. It sounds promising. Indeed, Tim, and uh, we would like to uh, thank the speakers and the participants of the debate. We also want to thank you for joining here at the venue or abroad online. Thank you. Thank you.